Good morning and welcome to episode 80 of our Case of the Week series published in partnership with ASET. My name is Kelly Twigger. I am the CEO and founder of eDiscovery Assistant, as well as the principal at ESI Attorneys. Thanks so much for joining me this week. As you know, on our Case of the Week series, each week we choose a recent decision in eDiscovery that highlights uh, key issues for litigators and those involved in the eDiscovery process, and we talk about the practical implications of that decision uh, for you, your clients, um, and your practice. As always, uh, the link to the decision that we're going to discuss today is either in the post or the comments, depending on whether you're viewing us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Um, and you can also find a link to last week's episode uh, 79 uh, that's also available on our eDiscovery Assistant blog. All right, let's jump into this week's decision. Uh, this week's decision comes to us from the case that Twitter filed against Elon Musk seeking to enforce uh, the purchase of Twitter and to take the company private. Um, as you probably know from the press reports, uh, this case was filed back in April of 2022 and is headed for a very, very short uh, schedule trial um, coming up in just a little over a month on October 17th of 2022. This case is being presided over by uh, Chancellor Kathleen McCormick um, out of the Delaware Chancery Court. And this decision is one of three that uh, Chancellor McCormick issued on September 7th. Um, Chancellor McCormick has 11 decisions in our uh, eDiscovery Assistant database. Of those, seven are regarding this Twitter uh, case that's happening. Um, this decision today is tagged, as always, with issues in our eDiscovery Assistant database. Um, those include instant messaging, Slack, a failure to produce, and proportionality. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we're in the litigation filed by Twitter against Elon Musk to enforce uh, the purchase agreement. Um, the decisions that the judge has been issuing on a myriad of discovery disputes in this case are usually by letter uh, to counsel. They are short and sweet, but they do a great analysis of the facts, and they also raise some really important uh, points that we need to focus on for purposes of engaging in electronic discovery. And this one in particular is going to be a short case of the week uh, this week, which is a good break for all of us, um, but it's a really important cautionary tale. And so we're before the court on a motion to compel uh, production of Slack messages from the plaintiffs filed by the defendant. Um, the courts note that this court notes that this is defendant's fourth uh, motion to compel here. Um, and in general, the motion to compel seeks uh, the production of Slack messages from plaintiffs 42 custodians that have been previously agreed upon. Uh, the plaintiffs argue that, in fact, the defendants had agreed that they only needed to produce Slack messages for six or eight custodians and not the full 42. Um, the plaintiff argues that any production of messages from the full 42 custodians is unduly burdensome and that the plaintiffs had previously only demanded production from the eight custodians and cannot now expand uh, that production back to the original 42. The court really starts by reiterating uh, their, her position from earlier decisions here, and that is that, quote, there's a substantial disparity in the e-discovery burden placed on the warring factions and notes that the burden on the plaintiff in this case has been substantially greater than the burden on the defendant. Um, as a result, the court is, quote, hesitant to impose a large additional discovery burden on plaintiff at this stage in the litigation. The previous decisions uh, from the chancellor in this case detail that plaintiff has produced documents from 42 custodians where uh, the defendant Musk has only produced documents from two custodians. Now, before we get into the facts and analysis here, it's important to note that the parties negotiated and entered into a protocol specifically regarding messaging platform custodians. And that protocol demanded um, a narrower set of custodians to be produced by the plaintiffs um, that limited the, the plaintiff's custodians to eight, as opposed to the original 42 that defendants had sought. Though this platform or this protocol entitled messaging platform custodians includes both Slack and text messages, both of which are at issue um, in this case. 
Now, the parties looked to the correspondent or the court looked to the party's correspondence uh, for the facts regarding the agreement to produce um, Slack messages from plaintiff's custodians. And really, the, the breakout of the correspondence went something like this. The defendants asked for Slack messages from all 42 custodians and the plaintiffs countered with six. Uh, the defendants then countered with eight. Now, both of the proposals from the plaintiffs included language that explicitly included Slack with the messaging platforms at issue in negotiating the number of custodians to be produced. The court found that based on the fact that both of the proposals from the defendants included that language referencing Slack, that the defendants effectively abandoned their initial demand of 42 custodians and agreed to only eight and then tried to change their position five days later and ask for the 42 custodian Slack messages. The defendants argued that they had always wanted the 42 Slack custodians, uh, that the plaintiffs had originally collected them, and that the failure to remove the language referencing Slack in their second proposal agreeing to eight custodians um, was a mistake, just an error. The court looked at that and said, no, we don't agree with that. Um, we're going to refuse to allow you to expand the number of custodians that are sought here. And importantly, the court notes that, quote, generally parties should be able to offer compromise positions without prejudicing their right to move for the full scope of relief to which they are entitled. But that is not what happened here. Defendants gave plaintiff the impression that they were seeking limited slack custodians only to then say that they never meant it. In this highly expedited case, there is no time for, quote, just kiddings, close quote. The parties must be able to rely upon one another's good faith proposals for the discovery process to function, close quote. And that's a really important quote from the court because as we know from other decisions on the case of the week, that if a party agrees to a limitation uh, in discovery, specifically with regard to custodians, if the receiving party can show through information received from the produced custodians that additional custodians are implicated, which causes them to be able to broaden the scope of what they seek in discovery, that the courts will then allow that. But that's not what happened here. And we've got a super expedited discovery uh, situation because of a trial date coming up in just over a month. And so um, the court really leverages those two particular facts in holding defendants to their proposal seeking eight custodians. The court does order the plaintiffs to produce uh, Slack messages for two additional custodians in order to be in keeping with that defendant's proposal. So what are our takeaways from this case? Well, um, as we just talked about, context is everything. And the speed at which this case is proceeding to trial is a huge factor here in this court's decision. But as I mentioned, there's no evidence put forward by the defendant here that slacked messages produced um, from the eight custodians uh, demonstrated need from additional custodians or there isn't any mention in the court's analysis as to any factual basis for why uh, the defendant needed production from the additional custodians uh, with regard to Slack messages. Now, this decision really does represent, as I mentioned at the outset, a very cautious takeaway. You've got to make sure that the proposals that you're making are exactly what you intend to make. Um, here, the defendants allege that they inadvertently forgot to remove language from their proposal that agreed to limit uh, the plaintiff's production to eight custodians because it specifically referenced Slack as a responsive platform. Now, practically speaking, uh, you and I know that the speed at which things are happening here and the number of folks that are likely involved on both sides, legal teams, uh, mean that things need to happen at a blistering pace. But it also means that with regard to discovery, you've got to be very careful about what you agree to. Uh, language is everything in negotiating the scope of collection and production. So be careful, um, especially in cases that are moving at a fast pace like this one, or if you've got a rocket docket in uh, standard court, which we see a lot on IP cases. All right, that's our case of the week for this week, short and sweet as promised. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll be back again next week with another decision from our eDiscovery Assistant database. 
Um, another one uh, next week will actually be involving Slack as well. Slack, as you know, is an instant messaging platform that is becoming of uh, very large prominence in the e-discovery space. So if you're interested in doing a free trial of our case law and resource database, you can go to ediscoveryassistant.com and sign up to get started or drop us a line at support at ediscoveryassistant.com and we'll work with you to get you set up. Thanks. Have a great rest of the week and I'll see you on our next episode. 